at Barbary. And and yes, we've just been reminded we are recording to these, today's session, so it will be available uh, to listen to after today. So my role at Barbary is to extend our hand to universities across the country and to primarily establish partnerships in relation to the provision of preparation and training for the SQE. But as some of you may know, Barbary's uh, reach and intentions are wider than SQE in the sense that we hope our provision will be part of university programs that enable students in all regards, not just around the SQE assessment, but also around experiential learning, training, development, and all the necessary functionality for solicitor practice in the 21st century. And that's really the genesis behind today's webinar. So today's webinar is the continuation of a program that Barbary started early this year. And we've based today's topic around some feedback that we received from our last webinar on uh, what people would like to talk about within the HE sector. And we've chosen a kind of combination topic, but I hope you'll agree that the subject areas are a natural fit together. So the subject areas for today are experiential learning and apprenticeships. But the overarching theme is really how you integrate these sorts of novel learning methods, well, novel in some ways, uh, into a program that's co consistent and coherent and creates an all-round training package for a young professional. Because I think a lot of universities and indeed training providers have provided over the years individual components of the spectrum of learning that's necessary for practice, but still the magic ticket of how you pull these things together into an integrated uh, offering, I think is still elusive to some people. So that's why I, I think it's a really good topic for today and I hope you'll uh, find the discussion stimulating. Just to say that uh, throughout today's session, we are very welcome uh, or we, we would welcome your comments and questions. It's great to have partners with us from across the country uh, from all levels uh, of, of education and practice. So please do put your questions, comments into the chat box. I'm going to do my best to maintain a watching brief over the chat throughout this session. And I've got some of my uh, willing helpers in the background too who are going to uh, prompt us as well. So uh, please do join in the discussion through the chat. I'll, I'll be very happy to take your questions and I'm sure my panel will as well. Which leads me to say thank you, first of all, to my panel and to offer a brief introduction to our speakers for today. So we have Professor Nigel Spencer with us today. He is the Professor of Education and Innovation and Professional Practice at the School of Law, Queen Mary University of London. I've known Nigel for uh, some time and I can sa safely say that he brings a, a, an unparalleled realm of experience to this discussion. Nigel has previously at his role at Reed Smith, set up one of the first pro professional law in practice programs of its type within the law firm, really thinking about the integration between education and training, and is now in uh, a role that he's fulfilling with great gusto at Queen Mary. So we'll hear more about his experience later. We have Professor Sue Prince, who's here today uh, from the University of Exeter, and who also brings a wealth of practice and practical experience, not least in I was just discussing this with her before we started, helping to establish and set up the first uh, legal clinic connected to the University of Exeter. So she may uh, tell us about her experience in that regard too. Dr. Anil Balan comes to us from King's College London. Uh, Anil Balan, again, brings a wealth of practice and educational experience. And he's brought that to bear in his new publication, Assessment, Pro Assessment and Problem-Based Learning uh, in the Law. And he'll be talking about that book and how he's set a standard for problem-based learning that he's now taken into the MSc at King's College London. I'm gonna change my background now to do the big reveal. I'm very pleased to be uh, at the University of Portsmouth today, where I've been spending a day in their legal clinic. And we have from Portsmouth, Gemma Hargrave, who's the Director of Clinical Education at the University of Portsmouth and a principal lecturer here at Portsmouth and it's great to have her here and it's been a really wonderful experience for me today to spend some time with the students watching them learning by doing in the course of uh, their interactions with clients uh, in, the, in the in the clinic here. And then finally and this is uh, somebody I'm very grateful to we have Lisa Slater. Lisa Slater is the Senior Earlier Careers Programs Lead 
at White and Case and has kindly taken the place of uh, Francis Seagrave. Sadly, Francis Seagrave was unable, sorry, Seabridge rather, was una unable to be with us today due to illness, uh, but sent her best regards and uh, no doubt will be listening to this session at some point. But uh, into Francis's shoes, Lisa has stepped and Lisa again brings a wealth of experience, not least in the area of legal apprenticeships, which we're going to be talking about today. So thank you to all our speakers and uh, I'm looking forward to the session and let's get underway. So I'm going to ask Nigel to start and um, I'd like Nigel to begin by talking about, um, sorry, actually, no, I'm going to go to Gemma first. I take it back. I'm going to, going to go to Gemma first to talk about um, clinics, given that we're here in Portsmouth. Um, yeah, Kai, you can probably take those slides down for now. We'll come to those a bit later on, but, but we will come to those slides shortly, Kai. Thank you. So, Gemma, without further ado, um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your work in clinic and why you think experiential learning in a clinical setting is so key to a student's development. Yeah, no problem. And um, thanks for coming today, Fris, first of all, and for having that lovely University of Portsmouth background behind you. Um, so yes, I'm the um, Director of Clinical Legal Education at the University of Portsmouth. And I have two main modules that are based around clinical legal education. One of them, Chris has experienced today, which is our legal advice clinic, um, which is very popular with the students. So we have approximately 70 students on that final year module at the moment. So it's a year long module and it's an alternative to dissertation. And then we have a second module as well called um, Community Lawyer, where we have students going out on what I would almost call mini placements into the community for the entirety of their final year. Um, so also another module that's an alternative to dissertation. So um, very much um, experiential learning. We started the Legal Advice Clinic here 11 years ago now, and um, it's certainly the Legal Advice Clinic. I love experiential learning and it absolutely has so many benefits to the students. There are challenges as well. I think the challenges came really in the setup of the clinic in the first kind of two to three years establishing ourselves. Um, when you have a cohort of students, even though that was quite a small cohort to start with, trying to find enough clients in a new legal setting to fulfill the needs of those students was really, really challenging. And we had to be kind of quite creative, to be honest, in terms of how we taught the students and how we um, brought kind of that experience of the law to them. So a lot of the time they were doing a lot of marketing with us as well as trying to get those clients at the same time. And we would literally take in almost any client so that they had the experience of talking to someone in real life. Um, but of course that was all really worth it because after those kind of initial two to three years, we became quite established in the sector in Portsmouth and now it's really a case where we could run every day of the week and see lots and lots of clients. Um, and we almost have too many clients for, for the amount of resource we have, which is quite a big challenge. So, um, yeah, it's been a really great journey for us. And in terms of the students, I think what is wonderful for them is, first of all, um, it kind of pieces together the jigsaw for them of what they've learned so far at university. So, and um, we were saying, I was talking to Chris about this today, but they rarely ever see a client in isolation, just about one particular issue. So they often have to bring together different parts of their academic training from the last couple of years, which to start with is really tricky for them because they're not used to thinking about the law kind of in different, in lots of different areas, multiple areas at once. They're used to just learning one area. So that's brilliant for them because it prepares them for employment. Um, the second thing is that they really are part of a learning community. So when they're in a seminar situation, they don't necessarily get the opportunity to bounce ideas off of each other in the same way that they do when they're in a clinical setting. And that helps them to kind of not, it, it doesn't just help their legal knowledge, but it helps their bonding with each other and their kind of shared community of, right, I'm going through this and so are you, um, which helps them to learn better and makes them really want to come to the session as well and the third thing I think is employability so students kind of oh, sometimes feel a little bit marmitey after they've been to the legal advice clinic so some students say afterwards well I you know I've decided I definitely don't want to do law now or I I wanted to do family law before I came to the clinic and I absolutely don't want to anymore 
Um, and sometimes it really solidifies what they want to do in terms of, well, no, actually, I really want to go into the law now. And I was going to uh, go into some practice in London, but now I want to do kind of high street in Portsmouth family work, go to the county court. So I think it's really good at clarifying students' thoughts on their future employment. Um, yeah, so that was a quick overview of our clinic and a few thoughts on, on the students' learning. Thanks very much, Gemma. That's really great. And I think there's lots of interesting points there around, I mean, certainly this, the multiplicity of issues, and I've seen it today, it reminded me of the challenges of, of real client work in terms of clients coming with wicked problems, as they're sometimes described, or complex problems where uh, it, it's a kind of multiplicity of issues in one box. And I think in terms of SQE, I was actually talking to some of the students today, there's a sort of parallel with, with one of the challenges of SQE around the uh, difficulty of jumping from subject to subject without knowing in advance what the blend or what the combination is going to be. So I think that's a, a really interesting point. I think in terms of guiding their career choices, again, something I uh, not really thought about, but that's a really good point. And certainly I found that with my training contract, which was my first major exposure to practice, that uh, shaping of my ambitions around the, the, the sort of subject areas and the departments that I sat in during my training contract was definitely part of that learning journey. And that's, a, I think, a part that we sometimes forget is the sort of not just how to, if you like, skill up students, but also how to help them shape their careers and, and using experiential learning as part of that. Uh, and, and one last quick observation that I think leads us then nicely into uh, Anil Balan uh, and, and, and the issue of problem-based learning is that challenge of actually getting clients. I've certainly seen that in clinics, depending on how the clinic is set up, uh, it can be a challenge for clinics early, early on of actually generating enough case example. So I think I'll, I'll go to Dr. Ballon now. Um, Anna, would you like to talk to us about problem-based learning as a form of experiential learning? Um, because again, properly simulated and effectively simulated learning can be a key part of an experiential learning program. So perhaps you'd like to tell us about this and indeed about the framework of your new text on the subject. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, thank you for inviting me along to this panel. So, um, as, as Chris said, I've got some experience of teaching uh, with problem-based learning at the, because part, the part of the law school at King's that I teach within the Professional Law Institute recently launched a uh, postgraduate master's in uh, law and professional practice where PBL, problem-based learning is is essentially the instructional approach that's used on on that program and it's for very specific reasons um before i go into that though um i'm sure most of the people here probably have an idea about what problem-based learning is but it's probably useful just to give a sort of a brief rundown of, of what it involves essentially it's a teaching and learning uh, approach which is centered on um, students engaging in active problem solving uh, to essentially deepen their understanding uh, of, of the subject. And uh, it, it's been around for a long time um, in other disciplines, particularly medicine, dentistry, etc. It's It's been a very established uh, method of teaching. In law, it's perhaps less prevalent, or it's at least traditionally been less prevalent. There are, there are certain law schools like Maastricht um, and York where, where PBL has been quite, um, quite well embedded, but it's particularly, you know, come to more prominence in, in recent times uh, with the arrival of the SQE and, and, and teaching students for practice. So essentially in PBL, students are presented with real or realistic problems and learn by solving those problems in groups uh, and reflecting on that process. So um, key ca characteristics of, of PBL include things like uh, collaboration, real world relevance, um, potentially there being more than one solution to a problem, uh, an element of reflection is quite important as well. But crucially, the teacher's role is more of facilitating uh, the learning process rather than a more sort of traditional didactic uh, role. So uh, it very much centers on students being the being very active in, in constructing their own their own learning. So the advantages of, of PBL and the reason why I think it's, it's particularly increased in, um, in prominence in, in recent times, uh, it's a way of, of potentially promoting uh, 
critical thinking and, and problem solving. Crucially, it's a way of contextualizing legal skills teaching, uh, encouraging self-reflection, potentially raising uh, motivation uh, and engagement on the part of students and also addressing uh, skills gaps. But it isn't necessarily the easiest uh, method to use or, or to embed. It, it, it's certainly costly in a lot of ways. It's time intensive, both on the part of staff as well as students. It's, it's resource heavy. Uh, it, it very much depends on students being motivated and being involved actively in, in their own uh, learning process. And at King's, um, we, we really, we launched the, the, our own MSc last year. We're into the second year of the, the programme. So we're very much in sort of the learning um, element of, of, of the course now. We're learning from experiences in the first year of teaching with PBL. Um, and it, it's, it's certainly proven to be a method which has got a huge amount of potential. Um, but, but one particular message I think it's, it's important to say is it's important for this method, method to be scaffolded as much as possible uh, in terms of supporting the students at the outset. And the idea or the hope at least is at least, you know, with, after a few sessions, the students kind of take the, uh, the baton and, and, and run with it. But uh, that, that kind of initial sort of foundation period is, is hugely uh, important. And, and I think just the uh, probably last point I'd make um, is it, it does have a lot of links with the apprenticeship model I, I would say as well but you know particularly pertinently in terms of what we're talking about in today's webinar because um, it provides the opportunity for skills formation through a vocational approach uh, and in that way importing many of the advantages of the apprenticeship model in terms of uh, potentially gaining disciplinary knowledge um, and the applied skills, values uh, and processes of a particular occupation but also equally it allows the opportunity to for, for students to mature as, as people and grow into a professional identity. Um, and and in, in my book, I explore ways of doing that and sort of identify five particular areas um, where, where there, there are ways of doing that. And essentially it just means um, adapting uh, to, to professional practice, encouraging resilience, um, adapting to changing environments in terms of technology, um, incorporating more vocational approaches and, and also being able to integrate academic and vocational skills. Um, but that, that was all I, I, I proposed to say at this point. Thanks very much, Andrew. That's really, really helpful. And I think that that you've elucidated something that, that, that is a bit slippery, this idea that, that problem-based learning is more than just uh, the use of problem questions, which I think in the past has been very much the kind of standard understanding to actually uh, laying out the process involved. And I think that process is everything, isn't it? That, that mm -hmm. and, and again, from my experiences today, looking at students in clinic, I've seen and spoken to some of the clinical practitioners here about how they watch that student journey from the kind of initial uh, challenge of even picking up the phone to a client and how to adapt and how to adopt a structured approach to that, to the uh, formation of you know, reasonably well-founded professionals. But I think it does take that you know, part of the learning is, is, is in understanding the system and the process. So very, very interesting. Um, I've, I've realized that um, as we're going through, uh, I think you can, or participants can comment, but don't panic if your comment isn't appearing in the comments box. I can certainly see those comments. And I've got a comment from Jamie, um, Jamie Fletcher, that I'd like to just share with Gemma. So um, Jamie asks, he said, I don't know about the offering at Portsmouth. It's been a decade since I was there, but do you have a placement year? And if so, how does this work in connection to clinic? Does it mean fewer people to do placements? And um, well, I'm going to turn to Nigel in a few moments to talk about placements. But perhaps, Gemma, I don't know if you want to respond to that. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about how the adoption of apprenticeship models can sometimes have a potentially detrimental effect on clinics as students find that they've got a place to do their, if you like, you know, in-person, real-life learning. We were, we were musing that over that clinic. earlier, weren't we, about whether that yeah. might be that happens because we haven't taken up the apprenticeship model yet at the University of Portsmouth, but it's just something I had in the back of my mind that might happen. And what um, about but placements it's... though? Do they, do they affect your numbers and how do you have a placement here? Yeah, we do have a placement. So students can take a placement between second and third year and they can now take a placement after their third year as well, which is um, quite different. So um, as far as I'm aware, and this is only anecdotally, I can say this, it doesn't appear to affect the numbers of students 
taking up clinical options in their final year. So there's no there's no connection between the placement year between two and three and any clinical options that they take. Um, and I suppose I, as far as I'm concerned, anecdotally as well, because I don't have any figures on this, the students who have the, there seems to be a large amount of students who do a placement who then do go on to do clinical legal education options in their third year rather than doing a dissertation. So they're kind of taking that experience they've had in their placement year and then building on it. And I really do see those students building on it. I think the students who have taken a placement really do stand out even more so in their third um, or fourth year, sorry, when they're when they're doing clinical legal education options. So yes, absolutely possible to do both here. And I think it's great to see that synergy, isn't it, between placement learning, clinic learning, and of course, in class learning. And obviously there is, a, again, an SQE element to this in the sense that, again, I've been having the conversation with a few students today about qualifying work experience and how with the new SQE model that enables students to bring together elements of learning from placement, elements of learning from clinic and start to build their portfolio of qualifying work experience, which I think is a, a potential uh, benefit to the new system that we're starting to see the fruits of as students are starting to use that. Well, let's turn to uh, Nigel now. You've been an advocate of placements for a long time and uh, what's your view on how they can best be integrated into a program of study and how they can complement some of the other types of study that we've been talking about already today yeah. no sure well thank you thanks very good to be here chris and thank you for asking me and, and just on that point Gemma, as, as you were saying that's been our experience as well because as at queen mary we also have a lot of clinical legal education with fran ride out and and our amazing legal advice center we have as well so it, i can really agree Gemma. you know i think they're very nicely there's a nice synergy there and Whoops. Who, who then do the other as well. So absolutely, we, we, we see that too, uh, I would say as well. Um, but yeah, very good. Um, <clears throat> so I, I suppose, Chris, just uh, just a, yeah, just a, just briefly for everyone uh, who I don't know. So um, I originally started this exploration about um, 10 or 11, about 10 years ago now, when I was sitting in in a law firm at Reed Smith looking after learning there and, and uh, thinking how can we uh, the way I came at the placement from Chris was really this point of how can we help people with transition points and how can we help people come in the bit as Anil and, and Gemma have hinted already in the sense of how can we make it really real for, for people so that that transition into the workplace then becomes um, a bit less of a jump um, and so that was when I'd done some mini experiments um, before that with shorter placements but then thought that a placement year might be a good idea so approached Queen Mary and Christina Perry who who's uh, who's here uh, Professor Pre Christina Perry who who was very supportive and and so that's how we started um, but that was very much the mindset you know the thinking how can we actually uh, help people at transition points just in terms of how we integrated it so again, it was, it's interesting your point, Gemma, we do it, um, the, the only way our students can do it is between year two and three. But what I was keen to do is, is to almost, was to think, how can we help prepare them? And so with Christina, we worked a lot to think, what do we give them in this, in during their second year, we created a number of little skill sessions they could do, um, not as an accredited module. Remember, I was sitting in the firm at that time and Christina was at the university. So we created these skill sessions to almost help prepare them for entering the workplace because I thought they've got the legal knowledge, they've done their core modules in years one and two, so they're ready from a knowledge point of view, but then how can we help them from a skills point of view? Just get ready. It helps sometimes, Gemma, as you say, if they've been doing legal advice center modules as well, that was great prep for them too. So anyway, I was conscious, Chris, of the prep in terms of integrating it. And then and then we kicked, we kicked on with it. And, and over the years when we've expanded it around different employers, now I sit in Queen Mary, of course, and we've got it in um, we've got it in law firms, we've got it in a charity, we've got it in an in-house team. So I suppose just to feed back that it can work in a really nice way across different types of legal practice as well. So the knowledge they have from contract law and EU law and all the modules that they've done in their first couple of years, it works really nice across a range of different uh, legal practices that they go into. Um, what we've also seen, I think, is because we've measured it over 10 years, you know, the, the, the skill building is absolutely there, even during COVID. COVID, interestingly, because of course there were the there was the COVID years to manage as well for the placements, but that 
that was an interesting on your point of resilience um Anil it was an interesting point I think of you know how they were resilient through that they had to have a different style of you know the work the workplace looked very different then so the skill building was there I would really emphasize the confidence again Chris I think I think with a bit of preparation they hit the workplace and after a couple of months and again we measured this the acceleration in the skills after two or three months when we asked one firm to measure it one year the supervisor said yeah, they're kind of roughly at the same as second or third seat trainees. So, you know, it works really effectively, I think, as a method. Um, often they join with the trainee inductions or with the apprentices in inductions in, in the firm. So they feel part of a cohort, even if there are a small number of placement students at that firm. And so that cohort feeling, I think, is very important. But but yeah, they they go, they go in, they go into a different practice group. They've done gone around practice innovation teams. They've gone into different types of firms. They've been in business services functions as well. That's worked very well in the marketing. You know, I remember one of them saying once they said, oh, it was almost like I was seeing under the bonnet of the firm and the employer. And I was learning in a very three dimensional way about legal practice because I understood how we sell ourselves to clients and things like that. So I think there were lots of really nice um, as Gemma highlighted about the skill of selling almost the way the, the students had to go and find clients. It was almost that point of, that you can do nice three dimensional learning there as well. Um, yeah. And we did because we assess it through and I'm not saying this is innovative at all, but because we assess it through the reflective portfolio and then a little presentation that they do back to Francis and myself at the end of the year, Mohammed and my team, um, that works I think that does build that habit of reflection. And I, I'm always a massive fan of how we can build reflective habits in, in students, because then, of course, they go into a very time poor work environment. And how can you keep that reflective learning habit, which is so important for them as they go through their their careers? So um, and I think the other thing I would say is it, it aligns very nicely, Chris, if we think of like a win, win, win for the student, the university and the employer. I think it's just a lovely model where I think um, Gemma and Anna, as you were saying, it's a nice way of like a two way interview for eight months where the student actually finds out do I actually I thought I wanted to go in this career direction, but do I? Um, and also it just fits very nicely into a recruitment pipeline for firms as well, where they can take one or two students through this method. And so it just works well for all stakeholders involved, really, Chris. But you're right. You do have to integrate it. I think do the preparation, get them in the workplace, still give them that space to reflect um and then they come back often again what we have measured is interesting that they come back they do actually get very good marks in their fourth year compared to non-placement students which is interesting as well and my take on that from all the interviews we've done with them over the years is that that's really down to the great habits that they build in in in, in the workplace in terms of disciplines reflection and 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 just yeah so so lots of lots of benefits um chris i mean yeah as you know I, i'm very passionate about this and i could speak for far too long about it so i'll, I'll stop there but i hope yeah that, that's some thoughts around how we structured it and sort of how we began it and all, then the benefits you see but especially how you might need to integrate it as well i hope that was helpful that was very helpful thank you very much and and well i mean two questions i've got coming off the back of that one directly related the other were a little bit more indirectly but i think they're a really interesting question i'm going to start with Helen's question, and it's nice to see you, Helen uh, Lovegrove, a uh, former colleague from King's College London. Um, Helen has asked, are there any issues with students funding an additional year at Queen Mary between years two and three? Do students still pay tuition fees? Uh, and does an extra year of study put some students off doing a placement year? Really good question. I think when we talk about all these different models of integrated experiential learning, uh, obviously we have to be mindful of the cost of living and and, and and the pressures it puts on students so how does that work with Queen Mary and indeed I'd offer to the panel for anybody yeah I, I think placement. yeah I mean I'll, I'll let others speak as well okay I mean I, I think for us they play they pay the as with all placement years they pay the uh, proportion of, 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 of fees and question of an interesting question of does it then put them off that's something I was wondering I think it it's a great question, Helen, and in terms of does this help um, from a DEI point of view and almost like an inclusion point of view, does it help inclusion to the profession? My sense is I think there's a disproportionate benefit over the years, I would say, for the students I've seen come through who are often first gen at university who then come in to do a placement year. I think the confidence it builds and their professional identity, for want of your phrase, I think, Anil, as, as well. So I think there are... There are a number of things to balance here, Helen. You're 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 quite right. I think I still would say that I think the the benefits are still very strong from it, even if, as you say, it does mean 
another year before they then go go into the go into the go into the workplace. I mean, obviously they're earning during the placement year. They're on um, they're on London living wage. We're a signatory of that, so they're they're earning that. Some firms very kindly pay above that as as well. So the the, the money is helpful, I think, from that point of view. But you're right; it is an extra year before they're earning in a workplace if they're going in, say, towards a trainee role at a solicitor's um, firm. That's quite that's quite right. Um, Chris, sorry. Thank you, Nodja. I don't know if anybody else on the panel wants to come in on that point. Well, Gemma. Yeah, I will. Um, it's a, pretty much the same for us here as well at Portsmouth. So the students don't pay the full percentage of their tuition fees for that year. And I suppose uh, taking up another point that you made there um, as well, that that actually because the acceleration of the students' learning seems to be so much better when they come back to university, um, I think that's probably not only going to have a knock-on effect on their their degree outcome, but also on their employment outcome after university. So perhaps it's actually uh, kind of a worthwhile risk, really, isn't it, in terms of paying that fee for another year? I mean, it's quite interesting. I've, I've been speaking to a few of the students today about SQE costs and the cost of SQE training. Obviously, at Barbary, we're keen to make sure that the costs of our training are as competitive as they can be and that that we provide students with optionality to to allow them to make those payments. And I think one of the things that, that we find, and it's kind of backs up with your point, Nigel, around integration is that enabling students to work and study at the same time uh, enables them to, to to manage the cost of their tuition alongside the cost of their, uh, alongside the benefit they get from working. So I think there is a, a trade-off there, which hopefully can work in the student's favor. Another quick question before we uh, turn to our next speaker uh, which i think is probably a student question from uh, anonymous but uh, it's a really good question actually is uh, what are your tips for for picking up interest within law and i think what that means is developing your own passion for a legal subject area because uh, and i'm hoping this doesn't apply to today's podcast the question says a lot of podcasts are super dull it's hard to learn when the speakers on them sound bored um, really interesting point so how can how, how, how did our panelists become passionate about their subject area, their practice area, and uh, in, what ways can, in, in what ways can experiential learning assist you in developing your passions? It's an open can, I, can, I, can I kick, kick off? Is, is that okay, Chris? You may, of course, yeah. Um, well, I think it's, it's all about talking to people. I think, you know, I got involved in my area, both in practice and in teaching, by, by, by talking to people and being involved in the actual area um, that, I, that I chose to specialise in. And, and when it came to doing research as well, um, it was all about, you know, conversations I'd had with people which sparked off uh, interest which made me go and read uh, about it myself and um, a lot of it I think you know tying in with the experiential learning aspect of it is, is is trying to kind of put a sort of a real world spin on a lot of the stuff that you perhaps read or listen to and, and actually get involved yourself in. Um, so uh, I think that certainly for me was um, the, the key to, to sort of staying involved. And, uh, you know, I fully agree if, if, if my whole sort of career had been spent, you know, watching TED Talks or anything, although, although there are some very interesting TED Talks, of course, um, then, then that perhaps wouldn't have kept me going this long. But I, I think just being involved and, and, and really talking to people is, is, is really the key for me. Thanks very much. Uh, well, I'll, t I'll take that as the answer for now, unless anybody else wants to jump in. On that one. I was going to say, learn by doing. You know, I'm a big fan of Ibarra's career experiments idea. You know, and just learn by doing. You know, as you say, talk, go and get an experience day if you can. And I, I'm not, I'm not saying that's easy sometimes. You know, as we know, but you know, or, you know, the number of trainees. And I'm sure this is the case for all, you know many of us on on the call. The number of trainees who came into the firms I was in and said, do you know, Nigel, the one thing I know I definitely don't want to do is a seat in that area. And then of course they went and became a trainee in that area and actually loved it, of course. And that was where they ended up qualifying, which was quite, you know, so stay open-minded I would say and experiment and explore absolutely before I went to Trowers and Hamlins I had no idea that construction law was a major practice area so but I was open to, to giving it a go and, and, and found my passion there so I think you're absolutely right okay let's turn to our next speaker and I, I want to talk now to um, Sue Prince who uh, has along the way gained the um, accolade of being one of the first uh, fellows with an innovation head at University of Exeter and has, uh, uh, has been awarded that status due to some of the innovation work that, that she's done there. And uh, so, Sue, um, what I'd like you to talk about is kind of entrepreneurship 
innovation and experiential learning? How can we be more innovative in the way we uh, create experiential learning and how can we encourage an entrepreneurial um, aspect to a student's learning, which I think actually goes some way to answering the previous question about passion, because often self-led learning is, it, it, it creates that inner enthusiasm. Um, so, Sue. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for inviting me along today. Um, I would say I'm passionate about uh, the future and thinking about new ways of doing things, and um, I embrace everything that everybody has already said. I've been involved in clinical education, um, very much um, supportive of placements. I um, run a placement program myself, and um, I wanted to talk about entrepreneurship particularly as being a way of sort of taking us into the bigger discussion about degree apprenticeships and that's because I think we can look at this word entrepreneurship in different ways so a sort of narrow interpretation takes us into sort of the world of business which I know that law firms are very interested in and increasingly so at the moment but an, a sort of narrow interpretation on entrepreneurship is one that concentrates on creating new ventures new innovations and there's a focus on business skills and startups but then um, a wider and broader interpretation that might take more account of what we've already been talking about is um, that we're looking at particular skills so that entrepreneurship creates curious and enterprising individuals with more sort of entrepreneurial mindsets. And I very much believe that going into the future of law, that the, the use of knowledge is going to be different because we're going to have so much more knowledge at our fingertips and it's how we use it and how we use it to think about especially positive change and growth and especially in um, a world with an increasing use of AI and technology. Um, so I think that knowing more about entrepreneurship and thinking about that sort of mindset means that we might tackle challenges in a different way, um, a new way of bringing about value and benefit to a community um, as much as it might do to a law firm, a new way of thinking about existing policy so that these skills might enable us, for example, to an area that I feel very strongly about is access to justice, thinking about new ways that we might um, approach access to justice and that these might skills might lead us to be, you know, as lawyers, more agile, more creative, um, more able to approach challenges in a collaborative way, and especially with um, people that are outside of the law, which, you know, traditionally hasn't always been a way of working. So I think we we move in this mindset away from that sort of idea that education becomes an act of depositing information into the minds of learners by a teacher into a sort of more collaborative approach of how can we make change happen in a positive way and being critically aware of what needs to change within our society. So we might, for example, um, co-create knowledge, and that might mean a different way of thinking about clinic. Um, and that means that, you know, rather than us necessarily um, parachuting in um, and giving a advice, um, because that becomes difficult because we end up with so many people that need advice, we might think about new ways of sort of developing workshops or creating new tools that enable um, and empower people to, to think more for themselves. So there might be sort of new ways of doing doing those sorts of things. And so. Um, I would define entrepreneurial education as one that takes our learning towards action uh, and away from just learning from books, but invites us to apply what we know about the law in a critical way, um, using our own individual experience to do this um, idea of transformation, transforming institutional structures or processes. And we know, for example, that... Um, you know, bookshops didn't invite, invent Amazon and we need to go out and think about new ways of actually approaching difficult um, concepts and, and um, structures. And so we might try and think, I mean, I love these words like being radical or being disruptive and sort of using AI to enable us to do that. So how can we apply that to the learning of law where, you know, traditionally lawyers are quite risk adverse. So if we if we need to move into this area, how can we develop these skills? Um and I would say that this approach is really relevant. I've mentioned sort of AI and um, legal tech, and I think we've got a massive growth in that area. Um, how how are we going to understand and use data better in the in the work of our work in law? I think um, another key driver is through the Legal Services Act, um, which encourages alternative business structures and maybe enables us to think in that sort of creative way that I'm talking about. Um, you could argue that um, sort of in the future that law will need to be less based on us 
knowing lots of things and regurgitating them in exams, sort of taking on that problem based approach, but also experiencing the law um, and learning more from practice, applying that back to um, our conceptual frameworks and reimagining um, how law might uh, work in the future. So that's a, a sort of introduction. And I think that leads into the idea of degree apprenticeships very much because we will need to think about mm -hmm. the concepts of learning about law, even the, you know, ph philosophically about law alongside how we're going to apply that knowledge to practice. And I think, you know, degree apprenticeship is a really interesting way of enabling us to do that. Well, thank, thank you for leading us into that. And thank you for those insights, Sue. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said there, particularly around, I think, again, going back to this theme of, of passion for practice, um, access to justice and the seeing access to justice coming to life, not least through clinical education, but through other initiatives as well, I think is one of those things that really sparks student passion. Um, Jamie Fletcher's made a very interesting point about uh, the experience, I think, at Birmingham University. Um, up until COVID, uh, it was compulsory element of all of our law degrees to have a uh, uh, to have a placement year, but post-COVID not so, and the attainment gap is now evident in those who have not uh, done a, a, a placement year. So that's a really interesting point, Jamie, around um, around the extent to which placement years can actually enhance and improve performance. So thank you for that. Um, I want to talk now about this disruptor, which is apprenticeships. One of the reasons I think I was really excited that apprenticeships came up as a topic for discussion is the fact that it is, I think, going to be a, a huge impact over the next sort of uh, five to 10 years as we see apprenticeships become part of the mainstream framework of higher education in the area of solicitor apprenticeships and solicitor degree apprenticeships more particular. I think access to justice, uh, sorry, access to practice is going to be enhanced and we're going to see a real change in the way we think about learning and again so I thought that point about critical analysis was really well made that actually the the critical thinking involved in client decision making is uh, of a different nature but equally uh, uh, part of the spectrum in the way that we've thought of critical analysis in a more academic framework in the past. So now I'm going to turn to, um, to, to Lisa to talk about apprenticeships from the point of view of, of your experience at White and Case and I'll hopefully seamlessly put your slides up as we do so. So Lisa can I hand over to you? Yes of course can you can you hear me okay Chris? I can indeed yeah. Oh great we've um we've had some um tech issues at White and Case today um um as well as fire fire drills going off so um do um forgive us if we um um if we get to that point but I think you've got my slide you're sharing. So many thanks for um, um, many thanks for those. Um, so firstly, thank you for inviting me along. Um, I am um, as a stand in. I really hope I will do this subject um, um, justice for Francis. But by way of my background, um, I've been at the firm for the past 18 months overseeing this transition um, to the solicitor's qualifying exam. So you've mentioned a number of you today, the um, SQE. So I'm really pleased that's on your radar. It's it's what we're living and breathing here because we've got so many populations um, to which SQE affects. So not just our trainees, the obvious population, but we also have across 32 of our offices at White and Case, a number of qualified lawyers elsewhere looking to use the SQE to um, um, requalify. Um, but equally, this huge population that we call legal support here, but you may um, be more familiar with the terms paralegals, legal clerks, legal interns, etc. So the job I've been doing is really putting the arms around and designing um, various programs, policies, toolkits for each of those populations. So um, that just gives you a little bit of my potted history. Um, but as of January, um, the new role I will be commencing is um, putting the infrastructure around apprenticeship programs. So business services, we won't, we won't, we won't talk about that because I know it's um it's um out of scope for this particular um this particular group, but that's going to be one population I'll be looking at. Secondly, the whole gifting of the levy. So we've got a huge levy pot overflowing and currently not utilizing it. So um, I've put together a paper which has recently been signed off on um, how we can work with 
charities, other organisations in need for um, some of our um, um, unspent levy to be gifted for um, good causes. So it could be something that may may touch your desks um, at some point. But for the purposes of the question I've been asked to answer today, which is, what is a solicitor apprenticeship programme? I've just put together a handful of slides um, to sort of guide us through some of those questions, which I'm sure will then act as discussion points amongst this group here today. Um, it's going to be really monumental for us. So we don't have a culture at all of apprentices. So what we've decided to do, and it's on the back of the London Law Society, the City of London Law Society initiative, which I'm hoping some of you have heard of called City Century. Um, this is what we've signed up for. So we're committing to taking on up to four solicitor apprenticeships, solicitor apprentices rather, per year, to complete the Solicitor Apprenticeship Programme with White and Case. So September 2025 is this golden number and, and this date for us to work towards. And it sounds like a long time away, but as we all know um, um, on this meeting here today, time does escape us. Um, so we will have to be ready by autumn 2024 in order to then attract the year 13 students, or in my language, upper sixth um, pupils to then be applying to start the apprenticeship the year after. So pretty much we need to um, um, kick off this programme design in earnest um, pretty swiftly. So looking at um, a few of these bullets then, um, and I, I won't monitor the chat, Chris, but will you just keep an eye on it for me and then any questions I can kind of tackle off whenever you feel appropriate, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we've got um, um, the first bullet saying level seven apprenticeship standard um, aimed at school leavers. So it's a degree level apprenticeship um, to the um, um, to the point that has recently been made. Um, level seven, it's going to be a six year program. So what that will look like is four years day release for our apprentices. So they will spend one day out of the office for that entire four year period studying for their law degree coupled with four days in the office completing work um, that we will um, um, design as part of the programme as what is appropriate work content for an individual that possibly has never even set foot in an office before joining our scheme. So that takes them up to the start of year five. They will then start completing SQE. So unlike our graduates who will um, have will be joining the firm having completed both SQE1 and SQE2 before starting their qualifying work experience. In effect, the apprentices are doing it the other way around. So by the time they reach year five, they would have completed their qualifying work experience and will then be um, joining the seat rotations that we have for our trainees, but also they will have to complete SQE1 and SQE2. Again, um, there will be an element of on and off the job study, um, but that will then take us through, hopefully, if all goes to plan, the end of the six year period where we will then be able to apply for them to become qualified solicitors, so long as they satisfy the various rules and regulations as stipulated by the SRA um, um, being in good standing, um, as well as the qualifying work experience 24 month period, which they would have had way more of way more than that two year requirement, plus the SQE1 and SQE2. So that is how we're currently thinking we will structure it. But as you can probably tell, six years is a long time to fill. So we will have a lot of work cut out for ourselves in the new year and actually working through pretty methodically as to what we think the expectation will be on the individual, where they will be housed, what level of um, um, of, sort of icing on the cake we will need to put, put around the... Um, um, the model that we end up um, adopting. So I think we can flip on to the next slide, if that's OK. Of course, I will do that for you. Just bear with me. 
Thanks, Chris. There we go. So I thought it might be useful just to share a couple of our perceived challenges. Um, like I say, we've not started this yet. So it's just from the level of research we've completed so far, being part of the City Century um, collaboration, we've attended various seminars and events, and some of these areas are already flag um, flagging a few sort of red flags to us, which are not deal breakers, but it just means we've got to tread carefully because a six year program, you really want it to see to succeed. So I've been really interested in hearing from the solicitor apprentices themselves, those that have fallen off the certain programs because they've not worked for them, just to be able to try and mitigate some of these these risks that we perceive. It's not going to be of any surprise to you guys that the 80 20 rule is terrifying us employers. Um, it's mandatory, there's no way we can get around that. So we feel quite happy that during the law degree component where the apprentices really will be doing legal administration type work, um, we feel that, that that is going to be relatively seamless to find a supervisor and a nice home for them within that four year period where they will be able to have that day off per week ring fenced for them to study. So we're not so worried about that first four year period. We're much more concerned about the last two years because these individuals will at that point need to sit SQE. As we know from the narrative and the various studies and results that have been pumped out so far, it's really quite dicey you know, it's tough it's a really tough set of assessments which um i don't think we can downplay i know it's early days and we've got a long time to learn from some of these lessons um ensure our prep programs are fit for purpose in um in, in ensuring that our students are geared up to succeed and pass the assessments but even still i think we need to tread carefully um and I think this is where we will really want to choose a training provider who can offer some flexibility. And perhaps during that last two period, two year period, it's not going to be fit for purpose to expect an individual who by that point will be completing work akin to a trainee solicitor, if not more so. Um, we may then want something more flexible whereby the individual leaves the firm for four months, say, to complete SQE1 in a block off the job in entirety. The advantage of that means they will bank so much of that 20% off the job study rule, meaning they could perhaps then return to the firm and work in a full time capacity. So I think we're really um, um, weighing up pros and cons, but I think the message which um, um, I would just like to share with you guys that any type of flexibility, there is no there is no golden ticket right or wrong here. It's just trying to work through what how can we put that individual in the best position to succeed because it's in everybody's interest that they get through these assessments um, in order to then progress with their career. So that was one point I wanted to um, um, to um, to mention today. And then I say about the design of the programme needing the layering. Um, what we mean here is you know, what wraparound interventions that we will want to make sure we put in place to allow the individual to thrive. Um, we've got some great initiatives, thanks to Catherine and the L&D team here, such as the coaching office. And it's just making sure that everything that we currently offer to our attorneys, we're making it fit for purpose, perhaps adapting it, bringing it down a few levels, but ensuring that our apprentices have access to exactly the same as what their graduate counterparts will have. And everyone loves the thought of parity. You know, you mentioned parity and everybody is, you know, in agreement fiercely that of course we need parity between 
apprentices and solicitor uh, and um, the graduate counterparts. But I then challenge that a bit on it can't be parity for parity's sake when there there are differences, as in the SQE completed off the job um, by the graduates before they even set foot in the firm to start their training contract is so different to the expectation of someone having to trying to impress their supervisor complete exactly the same type of work but equally have all those demands placed upon them so there's quite a bit of work we need to do as an employer and i'm sure other employers are in the same position in yes we want everything to be on a level playing field so that when it comes to the newly qualified positions nobody should be seen as the poor relative according to which pathway they followed. But in saying that, we need to give that parity point a lot of work in defining it, defining it and ensuring that those opportunities are available to all, but at the same time, there's flexibility in the program so that nobody is, is, is going to sink as a result of um, having to do something for one group because you do it for the other. So I, think, I, I think probably really haven't- <laughs> yeah, that's, that's articulated a really good point, that clearly, yeah. but ho hopefully you got the gist of what I was saying there, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's something I want to take to, to our university colleague now, if I may. Were, were there any couple of final points you want to make, Lisa? Um, I don't think. Um, I think my final slide, which you might just want to flick onto, I didn't really have much narrative to say around that. It was more um, just a few observations before we start the discussion over. We just can't believe there are so few apprenticeship providers out there. It's really frustrating from an employer's perspective that not that we have any problem with those providers out there per se, but I've always thought competition is healthy and actually to have more, more players in the market. But I appreciate there are so many regulations in, I think, Chris, from um, we know Barbary are as frustrated with um um, with the lack of opening up with regards to um, um, you know, what you guys would have to do to jump through some hoops to be a provider. But just from an employer's perspective, that is really, really frustrating for us. Um, we also are slightly concerned that with City Century drumming up so much interest and getting more than 50 firms now to commit to taking on a minimum of two per firm, you know, are there going to be enough Um um, um, candidates. Catherine, my colleague, um, attended the recent um, um, City Century launch event, and there were probably about 5,000 people there. So I think we feel quite comfortable that the interest will be there. But even still, you know, the the, the calibre of the individuals is what the, em the employers are after. So once again, we still will be fishing in the same pond for the same handful of students, I'm sure. Um, but that's just one observation I thought I would share. And then finally, um, it would be good to address this question, which I think you raised, Chris, on the agenda, didn't you, Will? Solicitor Apprentices aid the widening partici participation goals, you know, dot, 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 to be confirmed. But I think a few discussion points there, nevertheless. That, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that for that really interesting wrap up. And it's just great to have that employer perspective on this issue. And it, but let's turn to, to, to all both those questions. Um, I think a lot of people I've spoken to within the HE sector are keen to become part of this university space, uh, sorry, apprenticeship space. Um, but I think equally uh, have challenges. And I, I want to turn to that first. Um, so for those partners who are uh, part of our panel today what do you perceive as the internal challenges from a university perspective in becoming part of the group of providers who can provide the education for a solicitor degree apprenticeship um, like come in. so so chris is, is it okay if i kick off absolutely absolutely and yeah. Come to see, yeah um so uh, this is something that we explored um, at a couple of the institutions that I've been at. And I think what it comes down to um, is that really the whole idea of an apprenticeship um, in in some ways, in, in many ways, it's, it's more onerous than a traditional 
degree, um, you know, traditional law degree uh, with, with attendant higher costs and, you know, some of the initial sort of risk risk analysis that, that, that we did over this, um, the, the, the sort of stages in, in, in putting all of this together in terms of um, employer engagement, assessing apprentice uh, eligibility, the, the extensive needs assessments, um, before you even get to the sort of design and delivery. Uh, and then even once you get it started off, there's there's, there's the review and, and sort of governance and, and Ofsted involvement, etc. So um, all of which isn't to suggest it's, it's you know, it's, it's clearly a, a very, very worthwhile endeavour. And it, it, it's something that, that many more of us have to get much more involved in. But I think it, it can possibly be a scary prospect uh, in, in terms of taking people outside of their comfort zones but it what I would say to kind of push back against all of that is is actually when you look at the apprenticeship model and, and I guess this links in with experiential learning and other instructional approaches which are possibly familiar to law tutors is actually it, it, there's a lot more about it that's familiar than, than you would expect and you know it, it, it actually links in with the way that lawyers have been trained for for, for sort of many years it, it's obviously putting it in a different form and 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 you know much more sort of structured and um regulated as as, as it quite rightly should be but it perhaps is is it, it it, it's the unknown, which I think is, is perhaps the, the, the greatest kind of um, hurdle uh, at the moment. So that, that's, that's, I think, my, my take on it. Thanks very much, Anna. I think that's, that's a really interesting point about the uh, overlap between traditional teaching methods and apprenticeships. People tend to say uh, there's a bit of a shock of the new, but actually personal tutoring and that kind of student journey and growth piece is a feature of all properly uh, created degrees and, and and really it's a it's a model that, that as you say shouldn't be unfamiliar to people so yeah thanks chris um this is of great interest to us at exeter we have just um in the last couple of months opened a center for degree partnerships and that is a a centre to support um, a lot of the degree apprenticeships that we're currently running through our medical school, through computer science in terms of data analytics and through our business school in terms of um, partnerships, especially in management and finance. And so it's, it feels to me as though degree partnerships, degree apprenticeships are very much um, the way of the future in terms of the, the way we might work and combining that um, very I think sort of theoretical learning with um, practice is a great way for, for lawyers to develop. Uh, and we can see that from the evidence that Nigel's been talking about with placements, that if we've got students that are studying whilst they're working, that we know that they're more effective. So you can see that the degree apprenticeship is a model that encompasses a lot of the elements that we've been talking about anyway. It's just um, a different sort of structure of that same model. So we need to think of a way of, of how we can do it. And I think it is something that, that in terms of the legal profession, we need to have more conversations with um, as law firms um, and as educators. And especially because, um, you know, I think as just has just been said that, uh, you know, firms in, in terms of city century are committing to two or four students um, a year. But actually, in terms of universities, law schools are used to educating a large number of students. And if we are going to tip over into a different model for legal education, then maybe that needs to be that we think rather than having graduates and um, apprenticeships, that we think about a sort of si single model approach and how we might work through that. Um, and I think that has to come through through greater partnerships between um, firms, stakeholders of every kind and universities. So I think it's an ongoing discussion and we need to keep diversity and um, the cost of living crisis very much in our mind because that's where students are at the moment. And, you know, we talk about placements, but a lot of students are having to work just to get through their degree in non-law jobs. So, you know, degree apprenticeships where they're not having to pay fees, where they're working whilst they're learning and potentially can see the career coming at the end just seems to me something that we should be aspiring to. Absolutely. And I think we're going to see going forward as, as UCAS uh, envelops apprenticeships and, and it becomes literally a parallel track or a parallel set of options for students, uh, that becoming more and more of a reality. And I think it, just addressing Lisa's point in terms of volume, I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, I, th I suspect there's a huge powerhouse of of SME type firms out there who would love to partake in in 
uh, in the apprenticeship space, but haven't necessarily had the ability to do so because of some of the kind of functional constraints. But actually, I think once we lock, unlock that sort of SME layer, and of course, thinking a bit in terms of uh, regional firms and, and different types of practice, actually, uh, it might become a, a floodgate before we know it. Um, I suppose the, one question I want to put out there, you talked there, Sue, about uh, treating students uh, globally from the point of view of a law school. And I think that also involves, or the implication was that, that you know, treating the apprenticeship students as part of a spectrum of students with experiential learning baked into their degrees, whether they're on a apprenticeship pathway or not. Gemma, we were talking earlier today, weren't we, about whether there's a, a space for a kind of mixed economy of apprenticeships and sandwich degrees, placement degrees, experiential learning focused degrees, and whether actually that might be a way of achieving the same goal, but without necessarily, in all cases, of being under the constraints of the apprenticeship model. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what we have been talking about um, in the last few weeks here at Portsmouth, because we're trying to introduce the um, degree apprenticeship model. But resourcing is obviously a huge problem, isn't it? So having um, different streams for different students isn't really viable. We need to have uh, the apprenticeship students together with the standard degree students, ideally, because, well, for one thing, that's great for both sets of students because it exposes our degree students to the apprenticeship students who are actually already working and gives a lot of a kind of different perspective um, in terms of their learning. But from a resource point of view, it's much easier. And from a timetabling point of view, and I think that's one of the major challenges, to be honest, is timetabling these students, although it sounds like a very boring constraint, but it really is a constraint, isn't it? Trying to uh, fit those students who might only be released, say, on a Friday into the timetable when, you know, they'd normally be taught on a Tuesday or a Wednesday is actually quite tricky. So um, if we could try and integrate all of those students together, then that's obviously the ideal situation. Yeah, it's interesting, Lisa, you were talking about the challenge from a law firm perspective and having a 20% a loss of, of productivity, if you like, during that timetable. But equally, I think those crunchy institutional challenges, to put it that way, are actually a, a, bit, a big part of the discussion. But equally, it's a piece, and you know, with, with the combined minds and uh, intellect, if you like, of, of, a, of a university faculty and indeed great leadership ought to be. Uh, achievable and just to set the bar a bit higher something I'm interested in and this is something Francis was going to talk about is the sort of non-law space so thinking about well first of all internships and indeed apprenticeships that are uh, non-law but nonetheless have a legal component uh, obviously one of the distinguishing features of QWE is that QWE can be achieved in a variety of settings it doesn't have to be a law firm setting um, and obviously that if we start to think kind of uh, in an integrated kind of uh, multidisciplinary way, that also, in theory, allows law schools to start to work with other faculties within their own institutions to try and create a more multifaceted degree. I mean, I don't know if it's aiming too high, but what, what I don't want the panel to think about the opportunities for perhaps sharing the load, if you like, and creating a more rich experience for students by internally working with business faculties, tech faculties, uh, to create a more kind of multifaceted degree and indeed in, from an apprenticeship point of view looking at kind of a more mixed economy for apprenticeships chris just uh, just thought on that and, and um you know i agree with all that as you say as everyone said mixture of constraints and and, and challenges but also the opportunities there um you know the the degree apprenticeships that queen mary does with you know one with pwc one with goldman sachs in other schools you know so you're absolutely right you could have a really interesting different like cross-disciplinary one and I guess Lisa one of the things I was always thinking about when I was thinking about okay and annual your point as well about the infrastructure that one sets up and how one did it when when I researched a lot I was just thinking Lisa around demand this was okay this was about 12 15 months ago so a little bit before you know the momentum had got going a little bit but you know I was thinking how how can I you know what's the business plan almost for for this to you know just for, for that resource and but I wonder if if you if you end up doing it cross school Chris as you say perhaps that helps because perhaps if you have almost like a some type of shared service center internally or across the university of resource perhaps that helps us a little bit with some of the things that the coaches that you need and all the things that you need for all the progression meetings and, and all of that that are part of the official infrastructure that's needed from Ofsted and, and everything. Thank you. Yeah, and again, sharing that load between both different faculties, different parts of the administration, and indeed uh, different employers could, could could be a really 
important way of achieving this goal. I mean, I think I, I, we're nearing the end of time. I want to start uh, drawing things together. And if there are any final questions or comments, please do put them in the chat box uh, or in the Q&A indeed. Um, I mean, I think one of the things just to draw it together is that I think we are of a, of a collective view that, that a properly integrated experiential learning degree program, be it through a, an internship model or through an apprenticeship model, does achieve that. Well, it achieves multiple goals in terms of better learning, both in terms of outcomes and in terms of the richness of the experience. And I think that point around student choice and student exposure to different working environments is really, really strong. Equally, though, we've talked about the institutional challenges of building an infrastructure to allow this to take place and, of course, of making sure there's a pipeline of, of students coming through that will be consistent. Uh, and then the widening participation goals, I think, is the final uh, piece of the puzzle to make sure that everything we do does achieve those goals. We didn't really talk in detail about the, well, you, you began the discussion there, Lisa, about the kind of twin or two-tier model and whether we... Uh, the constant danger of creating a, a two-tier approach with apprentices, apprentices and non-apprentices. But equally, I think in a way, we're almost erring towards a view that the apprentices as an output, if you like, uh, perhaps have a stronger experience. And it might be, that the, might be that the tiers start to reverse themselves as this starts to embed. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Well, um, I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, our panel for what's been a really rich discussion and perhaps offer any, any final comments just to, in case I've overstepped the mark, are there any last comments that any of our panelists would like to make on today's discussion points? Nothing further to be said. I, I, I'll take that as, a, as an acquiescence. Good. Uh, we will be sending out some feedback forms after today, uh, and we'd very much like those who are attending today to feed into the next discussion, because if you've enjoyed this session, and I hope you have, um, you no doubt will have ideas and thoughts about what you think uh, people would like to discuss or you would like to discuss in a future session and indeed for those who've participated today I'm sure there are many among you who would uh, we'd love to hear from as panelists in our next uh, Barbary University Partnerships session so please do fill in the feedback form when it's circulated I did put a link to uh, a report that Nigel worked on on the impact of uh, internships and placement learning on student outcomes so please do go to that page and of course uh, please do go to Barbary's page Barbary Global to hear the latest insights about our learning models and we will be putting out uh, later this month our refreshed universities partnerships newsletter so uh, please look out for that and we'll be talking about this session and doing a, a kind of summary of this session in that piece so it's uh, 529 i think that's probably an appropriate time to to bring it to a close so thank you all once again for attending thank you very much indeed to our panelists for what's been a really interesting discussion uh, and, and uh, a lot of takeaways for all of us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, Barbary University Partnership Seminar.